Welcome to CW Jaw Talk number 20, which is part of our ongoing series about pre-Christian evidence that Jesus is the biblical Messiah. Previously, in four separate shows as part of this series, I've presented texts including Isaiah 53, Zechariah 12, Psalm 22, and Micah 5. And I have a number of other texts which are dated to before the time Jesus was born. Sometimes texts also can include uh, the time during which Jesus was alive. But primarily I focus on texts that are uh, universally basically accepted as dated to before the time when Jesus is believed to have been born. And so these texts, for the most part, except for possibly Psalm 22, fit this pattern, or at least provide us with examples of what I consider the best available evidence for why we believe Jesus is the biblical Messiah. And so why I say biblical Messiah is because our belief in the God Jah precedes Jesus. Our belief in the God Jah goes back to a time, back to the Garden of Eden, a real location, that in other videos I have shown actually exists and other people have shown that you can see in satellite photos as far as the geography described in the Bible. Everything fits. And whether you accept it or not, we go back to that point and we look at history. We look at the texts. We look at the evidence. And then we come forward to Jesus. We don't start with Jesus and then go backwards and build our beliefs from there. We've built our beliefs, if you're like me, from back there, way back in the beginning, when according to the earliest texts, biblical and non-biblical, the God Jah or a God-like Jah created humankind. And so from that point forward, various events have occurred but since that time, the texts that we accept have foretold a Messiah or Christ, someone who would come and save us from the condition that we're in right now, which we define as sin and death. Sin is just a term meaning incorrect choice. Humans have been making incorrect choices since the time we listened, in our view, to what was a reptilian type being or a spirit in human or reptilian form using a human voice to communicate with Eve and mislead her. This is our belief, according to the text in Genesis and other accounts of similar events in different languages and cultures. Since that time, humans have been making incorrect choices. Shortly after that, Cain murdered his brother Abel. That's according to what we believe, as it is written in the biblical texts. But before that time, the God Jah foretold of a seed that would help get rid of this deceptive serpent and the condition that we're in, which is sin and death, making all these bad choices, doing all these bad things. It doesn't mean we're always bad or that we feel everyone is bad in the sense that we can't do any good. We're made in the image of God in our view. But we also can see clearly that we're doing things that I don't think most of us would attribute to God in our view. That is, things like war, poverty, sickness, and death. None of these are consistent with the original account that we read in Genesis about the time when God made humans to live on the earth. So here we are now, and the reason we look back at these texts is to see where we came from in order to understand better the reason why we are the way we are today. And so as I just explained, in our view, when we do those things, we see this progression of bad choices that at one point culminated in the events that resulted in the flood, the destruction of the entire human race, except for eight individuals according to the bible there's evidence of the flood all over the earth but this show is not about the flood or the evidence for it it's about the evidence we have for believing 
that the God who spoke to Adam and Eve and who foretold a seed actually delivered. We believe that that God actually delivered on the promise that he made because of the choices that Adam and Eve made after listening to someone who wasn't Jah, but they didn't really understand completely, but they understood enough in order to choose the right way because they had everything. And that serpent gave them nothing, just a temptation, just a question. Is it really so? No. Well, yes, <laughs> in terms of what God said, but when it came to him saying, that's not true or no, you, you won't die. That was the point where they had to decide, right? So see, death has really been at the heart of this issue. Death, life, the tree of life. Will you really die? That was the question. She believed she would, which is why she hadn't eaten yet. Now he asked the question. Now she's not sure about it. Adam hadn't eaten yet. Now she eats, brings it to him. He loves her. He's not sure about it. And that's the condition we've been in ever since. We're not sure about it. And we keep dying, making these bad decisions. So in our view, we believe that Jah's way of dealing with those two, or really three, if you consider Satan as part of this original group, and I do, because he is, then there's another individual you have to consider too, right? If you've heard that story, Adam and Eve, which I just kind of summarized, and which we've all read or heard in some form, if you're familiar with that story involving Adam, Eve, and God, and Satan, there's another individual you need to account for, the seed. Why do I say individual when it says seed? Because the God who spoke of that seed spoke of the seed as a him, as one who would come and crush the head of the serpent, even though the serpent would bruise him. We'll talk about that text in detail another time, but I wanted to present it so that if you're joining us for the first time, you'll have a better understanding of why we're even talking about Jesus as the Messiah. What is a Messiah and what are we being saved from? That's what we're being saved from. And a Messiah is the one sent to deliver us from that condition, namely bad choices resulting in death that started back with Adam and Eve and Jah and one of his spirit sons. And we believe it's through another one of his spirit sons that he sent forth and foretold as this seed that would deliver us. Now in the New Testament, this one, excuse me, is called the last Adam. We're not gonna get into that text today. I just wanted to mention it so you understand the connection between certain New Testament references, Christian documents after Jesus was uh, born and died, and what the pre-Christian texts all the way back to Genesis teach about Adam and Eve. So Jesus was viewed as the last Adam. And it's in that sense that we see him. But even more, because as the account in Genesis explains, if Adam and Eve fell, and if according to other biblical writers and Israelite kings like David, we all fall sin, all fall short of the glory of God and sin or make bad choices, just like him, <laughs> he made a very bad choice. But Jah still stayed with him because he understood, just like I'm explaining, that we have inherited a condition. And so that's why we believe that the texts that fore foretell a Messiah speak of an individual from another source, like Micah 5, one whose origin is from early times. And that's why in the New Testament, it describes God as generating life within Mary, one who was in the line of David, who was foretold to be the line in which the seed would come. The seed talked about all the way back in, in Genesis 1, I'm sorry, Genesis 3, one through uh, seven. And so 
and maybe a little bit further in that text. But in Genesis 3 is where it describes the seed after the events unfold involving Adam and Eve's sin leading to death, which was the pronouncement that God gave them. So since that time, in our view, and I'm connecting this now for everyone who understands the biblical history, because that's the context of our belief in Jesus and why I'm talking about these texts. And I'm going to get right to Deuteronomy. But the reason I bring up Genesis to start with is because the whole purpose of these discussions is to explain what happened in these early texts, why we fell into this condition and how we get out of it. So the Messiah was foretold as one who would deliver us in these ways, and he would do various things. My prior shows talked about Isaiah 53. It said he would carry the sin of many, and he would deliver the righteous, and that he would suffer and die for many. I talked about Zechariah 12, where it said that the one whom we would look to would be pierced and people would wail over him as a son, as a firstborn, just like Jesus has described all texts, Isaiah 53 and Zechariah 12 dated to before the time of Jesus. Same with Micah 5, the ruler out of Bethlehem whose origins are from early times. And then Psalm 22, which though not likely dated to before Jesus' birth, is dated to the time when he and his disciples lived, first century, and is consistent with other texts which speak of the Messiah or of one who would be not pierced in the sense of being stabbed, but would have his hands dug out, basically, like you would have them prepped for an execution on a piece of wood, whether a cross or a stake. And there's additional material in that text that's applied to Jesus as well. But I'm just giving you a quick summary of our earlier discussions about some of these similar texts. So that now when we read Deuteronomy 18, it's just two verses. You'll have a better sense of the context in which these beliefs were shared by many. And as I'm going to show in one of our texts today, 4Q175, is part of an anthology that... Jews who lived before Jesus was born carried with them and looked to as far as their fulfillment in the Messiah. All right, so we have two texts we're going to look at today that contain Deuteronomy, what we call Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 19 through 20. I'm sorry, verses 18 through 19. There's more, of course, verse 20 can be considered uh, connected indirectly as far as the Messianic um, implications, but I'm going to focus on 18 and 19 and what those texts say. So, because those are the most explicit parts of these texts. I know that in some translations, like the New World Translation, verse 15 also reads similarly to verse 18, but I couldn't find representation in any pre-Christian texts for the reading in verse, what we call verse 15. So I'm just going to deal with verses 18 and 19. And before we read them, let me just show you the texts. So this is a fragmentary text of Deuteronomy dated to the mid to late first century BCE before Jesus was born. Let me bring you guys in here. And so this is, um, you can find this. I'll put links below at the Dead Sea Scrolls.org digital library 4Q33 or 4Q Dut F superscript. It means kind of high up relative to the other letters. So these are various fragments from um, the text of Deuteronomy in 4Q33. I'll just show you a few of them. I had this one actually on part of my thumbnail before I changed it to show the next text I'm going to show you, which is 4Q175, part of that anthology that I mentioned or collection of, of verses. But this is another view of a fragment of Deuteronomy from the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are numerous texts, uh, or fragments, I should say, of texts of Deuteronomy in various, in several of the caves, primarily Cave 4 of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But some of the fragments and texts are like this. You can clearly make out the letters, as you can see, but you don't always get all of the words. And so the reason I'm showing that to you is because when it comes to this text, 4Q33, 
or 4Q doot F superscript. It looks a little like, it looks like this because the, the whole text is not there. I'm just gonna use this to start with and then I'll go into the entire text as preserved in 4Q175, also dated to the first century BCE. Okay, so let's, let me show you the texts as they're preserved in 4Q33, okay? The fragmentary text right here. So it looks kind of like this. If you look at the highlighted section, that's the portion. This is Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. Only this highlighted portion. So the entire text reads, and we'll read it again in a minute, but we'll read it now. Deuteronomy 18.18 18 reads, this is the New World Translation I'm using for convenience and because I'm familiar with it and I haven't translated all of Deuteronomy. Verse 18 says, a prophet, this is Jehovah speaking. He's talking to Moses. He says, a prophet I shall raise up for them from the midst of their brothers, the Hebrews, like you. He's talking to Moses. And I shall indeed put my words in his mouth and he will certainly speak to them all that I shall command him. Okay, we'll get to the whole text in a moment again. But, but 4Q33 only contains this part of verse 18. His mouth and he will certainly speak to them. Okay, and then any, any translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls you read of 4Q33, I want you to understand this so you understand the evidence we have and what you can use it for and what you can't use it for or what, I still think it represents the entirety of the text. Obviously it's fragmented, so there's still more of the text that was there. It's just in this specific fragment of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we only have this part of verse 18, okay? And I'll put this in the notes below, but if you're taking notes, 4Q33 contains only a part of verse 18 of Deuteronomy 18 and only a part of verse 19, namely right here. So verse 19 of chapter 18 in the New World Translation reads, and it must occur that the man who will not listen to my words that he will speak in my name. That was the prophet from verse 18 that Jehovah would raise up. I shall myself require an account from him. We'll, we'll get to the whole text in a moment, especially as we consider 4Q175. But in 4Q33, and we'll make sure we're on the same page here. It only contains this highlighted portion of verse 19, as well as just, you know, a part of this last, portion, uh, an account from him. Part of that is also in the text, but um, this is the main part that is, is, act, is in the text. He will speak in my name, is in the text of 4Q33 or 4Q dude superscript F. Okay, now let's take a look at the whole text. So this is 4Q33, what we've just been looking at in terms of the highlighted fragmentary section on the New World Translation. 4Q, these are all fragments. There's lots of Deuteronomy uh, fragments from the caves. And this is just, these are just fragments from 4Q33 of Deuteronomy. Let's move, we're gonna move to another text. We're gonna move to this one here, which is as I've been referencing four, uh-oh, took us off there. This is 4Q175, again at the Dead Sea Scrolls.org digital library. Here's a color copy. And I changed the thumbnail to match this, you may have noticed. But this is pretty much the entire text. Multiple verses. There's one from Numbers here. Some of these we'll consider in future uh, shows. But it contains two sections of Deuteronomy. Uh, one of Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 28 through 29. It's not clearly messianic though, in the sense that Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 19 is. So the entire text is here and it reads pretty much exactly like, I'll read a translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls just so we're, all, we're in, not just relying on the NWT to match 4Q175, but they're pretty much identical. As is the portion of um, 4Q33, by the way, that is preserved, it's identical to the Masoretic text. Okay, but we're gonna get back to uh, 4Q175 here. In just a moment, let's read 
the entirety of those verses again, however. All right. So I've shown you one of the texts. Actually, I showed you both, but I we really highlighted the fragments that are preserved in 4Q33. And then I showed you the full text in the Dead Sea Scrolls of 4Q175 that contains all of verses 19 and 18 of Deuteronomy 18 as part of like a messianic anthology. So these were texts, you know, these weren't, these aren't just texts that were part of the larger text and important nonetheless, but they were taken out and isolated and kept with them or with individuals so they would keep those specific texts in mind when it came to the Messiah. Okay, and what he would do, obviously, of course, speak in Jah Jahuwah's name and speak his words. Two things we know Jesus did as far as what we read and all the accounts available that describe the things he said as coming from his father, not himself, and coming in his father's name. John 5 and John 8 state that explicitly. Okay, we'll discuss those texts further in a moment, but let's first establish the text of Deuteronomy 18 as um, sufficiently based on pre-Christian evidence. That's right. That's really at the, the heart of what we're here to do, namely show you the best available evidence that we can cite. This doesn't mean that we can't cite, obviously, things like the Leningrad Codex on which you know most Bibles are based, which stated to about the 10th century. So I mean, even Jews would accept that text, right? I mean, it's obviously been um, validated as far as the Dead Sea Scroll texts are concerned, specifically Isaiah and others as well. But there's certain differences, which one would expect, ex especially after the first century, because now we have Christian texts. And this is what gets into the, the Psalm 22 issue a little bit, as far as whether or not the text was changed or read one way or the other, before and after Jesus uh, was born and died, right? So we have that period of time where things definitely changed a little bit, including with respect to the divine name, and then became obviously contentious over the fulfillment of these texts. But we're looking at a text as read before all that controversy came in terms of Jesus being the Messiah, okay? So we're looking at this in the mindset and in the text of a Jewish follower of Moses before Jesus was born and when the temple was in operation, or at least used in the sense that it was during the time of the first century BCE. The Jews were still practicing the law more officially in, uh, in contrast to how they are today. Okay, Deuteronomy 18, let's read it real briefly. We read it kind of in, in sections previously, but let's read it together again because this is how it reads, and I'll read a translation of uh, the Dead Sea Scroll text, so you see basically how it's pretty much the same. Let's read the NWT, Deuteronomy 18 and 19, and this is how it is shown in the text we're going to look at right here. So, Deuteronomy 18, 18, this is what they were reading before Jesus was born. Jehovah said to Moses, I'm going from verse 17. A prophet I shall raise up for them from the midst of their brothers, like you. And I shall indeed put my words in his mouth. And he will certainly speak to them all that I shall command him. Verse 19. And it must occur that the man who will not listen to my words, that he will speak in my name. 4Q33 right there. I shall myself require an account from him. Okay, and then it goes on to talk about uh, the prophet who, who presumes to speak in Jah's name, but who, who, uh, whose prophecies do not come true. So let me just share with you. Here's how in the translation, I should say, the translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls by Weiss, Abeg, and Cook reads as far as the translation of this text right here. So we read on WT. Here is the text of 4Q175 containing Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 19. And here's what it says in the translation by Abeg, Weiss, and Cook, page 230. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, 
among their own people. I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. Okay, set that aside briefly. I wanted to read it from that just because, so now you can also, of course, obtain a translation of that text if you choose to, or just look it up. But now what we're looking at, you can you know, is basically exactly the same as I read from the NWT or that you're reading right now. Um, so let me go back to this text. So we have accepted pre-Christian evidence for Deuteronomy 18 that speaks of a coming of a prophet, a time when Jehovah would raise up a prophet that would do what? He would first, he would have Jah's words put in his mouth and he would speak what Jah commands him. And if others don't listen to him as he's what? Deuteronomy 18, 19, according to 4Q 33 and 4Q 175, speak in my name. That is exactly what Micah 5 says the future ruler of Bethlehem would do, that he would shepherd people in the name of Jehovah. And if you're shepherding, I guarantee you, you're speaking like the text says, like a prophet would, like Moses did. And so that's why in the New Testament, whether it's Matthew 11, Luke 24, or in the book of John, Jesus regularly refers to Moses as one who spoke about him, as one who wrote about him and as one whose writings he fulfilled. How did he fulfill it? How is he a prophet? Well, we already talked about how, uh, well, in relation to Micah 5, the future ruler would speak in Jehovah's name. Jesus did that all the time. He says in John 17, I made known to them your name and I will make it known. He says in John 5, I have come in the name of my father, just like Micah 5 and just like Deuteronomy 18, 19. Who else do you know after the first century BCE, right? Because here the Jews are still reading those texts. They're still looking for the Messiah. 4Q 175 is basically an anthology of Messianic texts, including Deuteronomy 18, 8, uh, 18 and 19. Who else can you think of? Now, there are certain Jewish figures that are referred to at times, but none of them, I guarantee you, you will not find any of them speaking in Jehovah's name or acting like Moses in the way that Moses acted. And how was that? He led the people out of slavery and he gave them new laws. That's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus led us out of slavery to sin and death. That's what I started the show out with. In case you forgot. But how could any of us forget? That's what the whole world is involved with. Now, sometimes we have periods of peace like right now, and that's a good thing. But we all know this world has cycles of life and death, and that's it. And we are looking for something beyond that cycle. And we believe it's rooted and related to these texts, and that these texts are reliable history, and that they contained reliable prophecy by people used by Jah, figures like Moses. These are not insignificant characters. These are people who were raised in the palace of the Pharaoh, who were taught all of the history after the flood and before it that was preserved and carried down through Sumer and into Egypt. Moses spoke for Jah. And these texts say, another prophet would be raised who would also speak for Jah. It's so specific that it says Jah would put his words in his mouth and he would only speak what he's commanded and that he would speak in Jah's name and that those who didn't listen would be held accountable. Okay, 
So over and over again, Jesus says, he only speaks what the Father tells him. Over and over, and the Pharisees and scribes constantly objected to him in that respect, even though they had these texts because they didn't accept him as that prophet, though they were looking for that prophet, as 4Q175 shows. But Jesus said he only speaks what the Father tells him, not his own will, not in the name of other gods. He only spoke in his Father's name, and he only showed us the Father, John 14. He only taught what the Father taught him, John 7, 16, 17. He only did what he was commanded to do by the Father who sent him, John 12, 49 through 50. He specifically said he spoke in the name of his Father, or would speak in the name of his Father. That's what Jesus did over and over again. I realize, and we realize there are texts or issues with respect to the name and it's used in the first century, but we don't have those original texts. We have the text Jesus is said to have fulfilled. And while the divine name is not used in Deuteronomy 18 or 19 explicitly in connection with the text, like it is in Micah, right? It says he would, he would shepherd people in the name of Jehovah. The fact is, that's what Jesus came and did. If he was going to fulfill those texts, he would have had to have done that. Otherwise, someone else is going to come and stand in the name of Jehovah or to fulfill Micah or to fulfill this text. If, how are they going to do that without being practicers of the law of Moses? I guess you'd have to say that they no longer need to fulfill the law of Moses or will have to start trying to fulfill it again in order to bring this about. But it already happened in a way where all these things were written about as having been fulfilled, so much so that the ones who didn't listen, the Jews alive at that time, the religious leaders, you can read about the account in Josephus, you can read about it in texts of the New Testament, you can look at the historical remains and evidence that the temple in Jerusalem that was devoted to the worship and sacrifices to Jehovah is gone. It has been destroyed. Jesus said it would be destroyed. And you can argue whether that was written before or after it was destroyed. But the fact is, that's what the texts about Jesus' life and teaching say. And what his earliest followers heard him say. And why they believed him after those things happened even more so. The temple is no longer there in order for the things written in the law of Moses to be fulfilled. And so again, unless it's going to happen another time in a way when those things can take place, the fact is these things already took place. They were expected to take place. Everything that they say would take place can be attributed to what we identify in the history and life and teachings of Jesus and the evidence that we have for his existence. So there's not really a bad reason for making these connections and looking to Jesus as the fulfillment of the seed that Jah told Adam and Eve would come and deliver us from the very thing they lost. Bad choices equal sin and death. Listen to Jahawah. What in listening to Jah will not give us more life? In other words, or I guess I should say, there's nothing Jahawah tells us to do that kills us. It's what we choose to do that kills us. And then we just spend the rest of our life trying to stay alive until we die because we've been making bad choices and we keep making bad choices. Some more than others, some worse than others, but we all die. We have been enslaved to sin and death. And that's how Jesus is similar to Moses. He's delivered us from sin and death. That's why you hear Christians talk that way all the time. Sometimes it can get a little preachy, I know, but people just get passionate about their beliefs at times when we think of them like this and we realize that we have pre-christian evidence that shows us that these things were believed and taught and are part of a lineage of people that goes beyond even moses back to abraham all the way to figures like enoch and adam and the garden of eden that we can show once existed where the persian gulf is and where once Four rivers combined as one and flowed through it. But now Jah has hidden it after the flood. And for good reason. He hid it from Adam and Eve after they had started to disobey him. 
because Jah did not make creations to be abused. He didn't make creations like us to be abusers. Now, we sometimes, because of our inherited imperfection, end up doing things that Jahawah cannot tolerate, which is why we die. But through the sacrifices that were provided through the law of Moses, the Jews could stay alive in the sense that they had a relationship with God, different than all other people, with special protection. And then the Messiah came and, in our view, deliver us, delivered us from those things, death, sin, and the need for temporary sacrifices. That's why we don't have the temple anymore. That's why Jesus didn't come and keep that process in place because it was no longer needed. In our view, he fulfilled it. Just like the text of Deuteronomy says would take place in terms of a prophet like Moses who would be given Jah's words to speak, just like Moses. And who would speak in Jah's name, not his own name, just like Moses. We believe Jesus is just like Moses, only more because according to what he told us and to what even these pre-Christian texts like Micah and others that we'll read at another time, Isaiah 9, 6, he's more than Moses. He's more than just a man. But he became a man in order to do the things that the man Adam couldn't do and that the man Adam, uh, the man Moses said would be done in part according to Jah's will as spoken to him after leaving Egypt. So these are some of the texts together with the others that I've presented so far. This is the fifth part in this series on the pre-Christian evidence that we believe shows Jesus is the biblical Messiah. We believe the evidence exists in all of the texts that we have for his life and teachings and what was said about him, that he was a prophet like Moses who spoke in the name of Jehovah, Moses, God, yah o yah o Ja, and that he only spoke what the father told him just like he says over and over again and that's why we believe him not because he's some rival god to jaw he only does what jaw tells him and that's why christians like paul said that people would bow to jesus to the glory of God the Father. And that's the New Testament teaching about the Christ, that he's a mighty God like Jah and like the other sons of Jah, but he's not Jah. We understand many Christians believe in a trinity or have a trinitarian metaphysic that they use to explain and understand some of these texts, but that's not what we use. We just use these texts and we take what Jesus says in texts like John 10, where when the Jews came to him and said, we accuse you not for a fine work, but because you're making yourself a God. Now, some translations will say you make yourself God, but that's inconsistent with the text because Jesus responded to them and said, by quoting Psalm 82, is it not written? You are gods. He used the plural gods for them because they were the sons of God whom God called gods in that text and against whom the word of God was coming. But with him as the son of God, that's not the case. He only speaks the words that God tells him. So even more so, Jesus' point in citing that text, if these gods can be called a god, then why do you object that I call myself the son of God? I'm not, the word of God isn't coming against me. It was coming against those gods and even they are called gods. And that's how we know they were accusing him of being a god because he was talking about being the son and they understood the sons of God as gods. Besides, how would Psalm 82 be a defense for anyone who claimed to be God? Because that text speaks of the sons of God as gods. And that's exactly what Jesus quotes in his defense. So we believe Jesus is the son of God, the firstborn, the only begotten God created first by the father as the beginning of his generative power truly born from the Father in a spiritual sense that we don't try to explain beyond what the text says. Just like when humans give birth to human children, they're not the same age, they're of the same nature, but they're not the same. 
They're separate individuals. That's how the Bible talks to us when it comes to Jesus and his father. So I just wanted to add that a little bit in case we have some Jewish listeners or others who see us as potentially maybe similar to other Christian groups in, in terms of the Trinity. We understand it. We've discussed it. We don't accept it. But we allow Trinitarian Christians to join us in promoting Jesus as the biblical Messiah if that's what they agreed to do with us without getting into these metaphysical discussions that really only lead us away from this evidence, right? What evidence is better? A metaphysical discussion about the relationship between Jesus and his father or the Messiah and, and Jah or citing the actual evidence that we can show is really here with us physically and that was written before the time when the events that is, are spoken about take place. That's where our time should be. Our time should be on these texts and the meaning and understanding of these texts to the extent that we can maybe debate here and there because we may have to in order to help bring clarity or to refute a dangerous view. But the, our objective is not to constantly seek out arguments. Our objective is to promote these texts and the reasons for our belief in people like Jesus as the seed all the way back to Genesis and as foretold in various other books like Deuteronomy, the Psalms, Isaiah, Zechariah, Micah, Malachi, and many others that I'm going to get to as part of this series. So I may take a break as far as the continuation of this series and do a few other shows, but we'll come back. We've done five to this point, and um, you'll see the links below in the description. And so we need to add this text, if you haven't already, to our evidence that is datable to before the time when Jesus was born and the things it speaks about as uniquely fulfilled in him at a time when the things that the texts speak about and that the Jews practicing the law of Moses were actually doing, actually involved with, actually sacrificing to Jah in expectation of the one who would set them free like Moses and who would speak to them the things that Jehovah said not what he wanted to say and Jesus we believe did that better even than Moses and so but Moses did it well enough and he did it outstandingly to the extent that humans can and so we recognize Moses as a great figure in the lineage of people that are a part of our history leading up to the fulfillment of these texts in Jesus as the Messiah.